Um, as someone who lives in Delhi, I cannot start this presentation without observing the very unfortunate events in Delhi this last week. Um, all of us are privy to it. Um, sometimes I wonder if it is really now the same city that provided Ritin the canvas to develop his art and practice in the 1970s and 80s, slowly emerging as the capital for a new India. And to echo uh, what Nancy suggested earlier, uh, towards the end of the presentation, I will like to the, pose the question of um, the rise of aesthetics in relation to politics, uh, cultural change, and design. Three years back, researching for an exhibition on post-independent histories of textiles in India, the only published material that I could find on Ritin was a 10-page essay in Art and Deal magazine, passionately researched and comprehensively written by Ushmita. And I'm delighted, Ushmita, that uh, your initial interest in his life and work has taken the form of this very important exhibition. Um, Chatterjee and Lal, Culture Bagh, um, G5A, thank you so much for honoring the need for such insights into design histories in India and for inviting me to be a part of this symposium. The first time that I recall hearing about Ritin and his work is through a friend and mentor, the late Martan Singh, or Mapu, as many of us knew him. Many of you know or may know of his involvement in the field of Indian textiles. And he had an outstandingly photographic memory and was able to recount instances from his life with a remarkable kind of exactitude, which thankfully did not deny the listener an equal measure of emotion. So he really, he took you back into that space. And in this case, since I was constantly talking to him about you know people he knew and worked with, he always spoke about Ritin as, uh, I mean, his memory of Ritin was through the curtains he designed. Uh, for the Asian Games opening ceremony at the newly constructed Siri Fort Auditorium. So Mapu was this very theatrical character. He would say, oh, those absolutely stunning curtains, you know. And one never really, I think, Ushmita, you agree, has never really got to see those images. Uh, but I think that, you know, I used to always wonder why for someone who had a certain kind of visual aesthetic, Mapu would talk about him in these very, very kind of larger-than-life terms. And it was sort of confirmed to me last weekend when I was at the NID and I was with some of the students, his students at the NID when he went to teach briefly, um, that in fact by that time he was a major celebrity. Um, so I'm inclined to think that his, re his Mapu's recollection of Ritin's work uh, was in fact a depiction of his larger than life stature. Something like I said was confirmed last weekend by some students and faculty at the NID in Ahmedabad where I was part of a seminar celebrating five decades of the founding of NID's textile department. Romani Jaitley credited uh, with starting a new wave of designs for block printing through the Jaipur-based brand Anoki, recalls him being quite a star already when he came, uh, when she was a young professional working between Jaipur and Delhi, Delhi, given that it was difficult to come across artists in India who work with textiles in their own right. Most of the field was full of designers associated with companies and studios not commanding their own name. On the contrary, he was well known, his work coveted, and in this respect, a celebrity of sorts, I believe, when he arrived, like I said, to teach at NID in these formative decades. Of course, this for me is a very kind of foundational and very important image um, from his years at Fab India, where he also did the cover um, for, the, uh, for the annual reports. Even today, textiles are seen as materials which feed either into clothing or home furnishings, even if a new generation of textile makers have begun to identify themselves as artists. Only a couple of these, if at all, are granted solo exhibitions in galleries and are far from the price mechanics which govern the modern and contemporary art market otherwise. Written with A, a company which produced block printed garments which he ran with Bharti Sharma, Two, designs for Fab India, which were clearly so massively copied by the market that they necessitated later the addition of his signature for authenticity. And three, special commissions which he received through patrons and architects that have been mentioned can be seen as pioneering in managing many of these roles. And as Ushmita has already indicated earlier, patronized by leading architects um, in Delhi at the time. Interestingly, I can't think of anyone like him today. My presentation is um, mainly in two parts. The first tries to create a larger context for the, um, for the situations uh, and the infrastructure that actually um, Ritin was functioning within, um, or he was a part of. And the second is to look at 
some of his peers' works, some of his contemporaries, and to try and understand whether actually his aesthetic and unique, distinct visual um, capabilities actually uh, were reflected or how they were different from these practices. So we now go back to the India of the early 1950s um, when the country was trying to articulate a vision for his design and crafts and certain, make, certain markers may be seen as definitive. The first was the establishment of government institutions such as the All India Handicrafts Board and All India Handlooms Board. In the 1950s, these were led by individuals such as Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay and Pupul Jekar on the invitation of the country's first Prime Minister, Nehru. Seeing that most of India's population lay in rural areas, the primary concern of these individuals and institutions was the generation of livelihood through hand manufacture. So just to give you an example, for instance, what people like uh, Kamla Deviji would do was invite traditional cotton, ikat, telia, rumal weavers in Andhra to go to Banaras and learn silk weaving. So actually that's how then silk weaving starts getting combined with ikat in Andhra Pradesh in the 50s and starts a completely new tradition of what we today call, say, the Pochampalli saris from Andhra. Or, uh, you know, there were eventually institutions like the HHEC, the Handloom and Handicrafts uh, Export Corporation of India, that were taking all these products and marketing, marketing them internationally. So one of the things they would do, for instance, is bring in someone like Hussein to design toys that would then be made, um, you know, and sold through these shops that they ran. With Nehru's emphasis on building, so what you see here is an advertisement uh, of Handloom House, which was one of the government-owned emporia that again became a channel. Uh, like Shona of the HHEC was a series of shops that were uh, situated in New York, Paris, and you know leading capitals of the world to export this Indian handmade product. With Nehru's emphasis, emphasis on building state-supported infrastructure, dams, scientific research, and so on. These developments for handcraft um, have been observed from different perspectives from today's standpoint. One, that they reflected a keen grasp of the ground realities, realizing that these rural sectors needed special attention, uh, given that the country was completely devastated through colonial rule. Something reflected in the continuation of Mahatma Gandhi's ideas for Khadi, Swadeshi and rural development through their consolidation in the Khadi and Village Industries Corporation of India or the KVIC as we more commonly know of it today. The other view, however, is critical of Nehru's efforts and blame the relegation of rural hand manufacture into such state-supported institutions as the death of rural industries. Something which sustained the national movement was suddenly a sunset sector as opposed to the sunrise sectors of large industries and mechanization. It has been seen since, as it is today to a large extent, cottage industries, a term to suggest hand manufacture within rural households. This attitude, coupled with what has been seen as an overarchingly patronizing approach to craftspeople and artisans through private networks such as the craft councils, has been observed to have created a wide chasm between these makers and their contemporary counterparts functioning as workers in the mechanized sector. So you have this kind of, almost like a hierarchy between those workers who work in the mechanized sector and industry uh, being in a certain kind of social position apart from econo economic position and those making by hand as making cutesy artifacts that you find even today uh, being sold in bazaars. The second um, brings me to a very important exhibition in um, 1955, at the height of cultural diplomacy initiatives between the United States and India, an exhibition titled Textiles and Ornamental Arts of India was presented at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Receiving a very large number of visitors, curious about a newly independent country with a long history, uh, something which was evoked through the textiles and objects on display, that had further supported the independence of other Asian and African countries to come out of colonial rule. This exhibition was reciprocated in 1959 with an exhibition in Delhi titled Design Now in America and Europe. I'm sorry, I have a very small image of it. It's not a very well-documented exhibition, but apparently it received a million visitors in Delhi. The collection on display, boasting of furniture and everyday products designed by the most famous names in the world then, became the seed collection for the formation of the National Institute of Design in 1958 in Ahmedabad, where the whole collection still resides. The result, if craft had been relegated earlier as hand manufacture opposed to mechanized production, here was Indian ornamental arts, not design, opposed to American and European design. 
In a post-Second World War scenario in Europe, industrial production was given massive support by governments in Italy, Germany, France to develop design industrially produced, which was opposed to handmade, decorative or ornamental arts, mainly seen to boost the export of its production all over the world from these countries, apart from, of course, providing basic amenities to populations where large-scale devastation had taken place. Take place. So in Europe, because cities had completely been destroyed, industrialization was this way of um, actually providing very basic everyday products that were affordable. But once you have that kind of scale of production, what do you do? So you export. So today design has been seen intentionally as this kind of device that was developed in opposition to ornamental arts, decorative arts and craft as something which is superior, which was then. So interestingly, uh, one perspective um, is, and it's a hugely controversial perspective to propose, but many people have started echoing this now, is that, you know, NID was set up on a Ford Foundation grant, which came from American capitalist money. So it was an indirect way of investing in a newly independent country, which clearly saw the potential of training the country in consumer tastes that could become a market for American industrial products, you know. So... So, you know, these are very interesting perspectives, how you actually, and we saw, we see during this period, America actually investing all over the world in design institutions, in these kinds of movements, to facilitate an appreciation for European and American design aesthetics. So design, as a result, has been, come, has been seen, has come to be seen as a kind of value addition, while craft as mere skill which caters to the requirements of design. It is similar in the art world, of course, as many of you know, where the producers of works are often not even acknowledged in favor of the conceptualizer who is the artist. So it, with, it was within such sentiments for building a post-independence India that NID was self was set up uh, with a formal design mandate for the country and in time started very strongly asserting design as a differentiator from craft and art. It is a common perception that the visual arts has often kept design and its functionalism at bay, but so has design. I recall even through my own time at the NID between 2001 and 2006 how important it was to look at students who came from art colleges as merely skilled but not necessarily trained in the capabilities of the kind of conceptual work and social responsibility that designers were meant to carry out. So this is, I think, a very interesting image of NID because here was this new campus that came up in the 50s. You have a very old historical monument there and I think the opposition of these kind of two aesthetics is a very good reminder of what was, you know, what was design doing. All of this completely new kind of architecture was coming into uh, cities which at that point still had buildings and architecture from the late colonial period. Indo-Saracenic style and suddenly you had this import um, of a new kind of uh, way of living um, and um, you know we've still not fully assessed what were the ramifications by people who actually lived, lived through these periods on, on you know what it did to the psyche and so on and so forth. The third aspect of this period that um, I want to talk about, apart from the large-scale infrastructure that was enabled through the state, you have the emergence of the NID. Um, in the 1950s, something simultaneously happened through the government, uh, the establishment of a network called the Weaver Service Centers, aimed at providing a link between traditional craftspeople and designers in areas were situated in or close to traditional manufacturing centers. So even today, about Two dozen of them continue to function in context as diverse as Banaras, Kanchipuram, Indore, Bombay, Delhi, and so on. For many generations of India's first set of graduates from art colleges in the 60s and 70s, these provided a stable government job, a 9 to 5 job, where they could use their skills towards the design of patterns and motives for handmade textiles, working along with makers from families who had inherited the skills and training from a previous generation. So sometimes a young generation of a traditional family of weavers would also be employed at the Weaver Service Center. Simultaneously, they were working with young graduates from schools like JJ School of Art, Baroda, and so on and so forth. You know, And it was really meant to facilitate. So if I was a designer who was looking to produce something, the WSC would be a good place for me. Uh, to go and access resources in the region that I want to work. So these were actually set up with, by Papul Jekar and they continue to be relevant today. I'm showing you this particular image because one of the, one very, very important series of for almost 10 years commissions that were done through the Weaver Service Centers was something called Vishwakarma as part of Festivals of India. Uh, for 10 years, 
huge exhibitions went all over the world, designed by Dashrath Patel, uh, involving curators like Martin Singh, Rajiv Sethi, that were really aimed to show the best of Indian culture contemporarily and traditionally ar around the world. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that you also brought up, Nancy, was and uh, because you know there was a certain kind of, at that point, India had to project a secular image, a word that's controversial today, but at that time it was very conscious. So what happened was a lot of religiosity in textiles because ultimately textiles were either rites of passage, they were for trade, for, for the sacred. Um, a lot of Indian traditional textiles were actually embedded in the religiosity and their spiritual connotations. And what happens is during that time is a lot of these religious connotations are taken away. So you have a pichwai with Krishna, where the Krishna is taken away but only the lotuses are kept. You know, there's a certain kind of a, um, there, it's, it's a kind of minimalization and contemporization taking place. So similarly we see that, so this is actually a tree of life, um, you know, which was reproduced um, from the Baker's volumes, but then you sort take away certain kind of context and original motives to make it now a work of art in a, in a home or an interior. So this was very much, you know, the, the politics of design at that time through the WSCs. Artists such as Manu Parekh, Arpita Singh, Amrit Patel, who are well-known contemporary artists today, worked in these WSCs, um, as they are called, um, the short form, form has become WSCs, on revival projects, traveling to the fields documenting crafts. Uh, you know, sometimes there would be famine in certain areas like Jaisalmer, and these they would be sent to actually go and document what can be done, can a new scheme for employment generation be created, um, while following a while they did all of this while following a completely independent trajectory for their own artistic practice, working at home in their own words uh, in the evenings with media such as oil on canvas and watercolors on paper. One of, the, one of these artists was also the late Adi Mulam, who developed, who designed this work for the Vishwakarma exhibition, uh, who later, of course, became a very well known contemporary abstract artist. Um, so largely, and from today's point of view, unfortunately, many of them until recently had rejected this part of their work. The fact that they worked in textiles with the WACs, often having 30-year careers in it, with the result that even in their major retrospectives of their work held recently, the textile work has, far from being included, not even being mentioned. Within such dynamics of these hierarchies between the handmade, the machine-made, craft and design, art and design, once he is written meandering on a path quite his own. Um, perhaps the only other artist from the WSC who actually chose to focus on working with textiles primarily uh, is Ajit Kumar Das, who lives in Calcutta and actually had a solo exhibition at a gallery in Delhi uh, just last month. Um, and what is interesting, I'm just going to show you Ajit Kumar Das's work to actually reflect what were the kind of uh, positions uh, that these artists would take. So you have something like this that clearly Ajit Kumar Das takes from the Vishwakarma exhibitions, referencing very detailed, intricate botanicals. I was talking about the pitchwais. So Krishna is removed as an icon and you only keep the cows, uh, suddenly become the, becoming this kind of aesthetic project for an interior. Uh, uh, then Ajit Kumar Das would suddenly, you know, ha a certain point in his life, create these very interesting abstract uh, paintings, all on textiles. And similar to Ritten, you see this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, movement of calligraphy, of, of certain kind of tantric symbolism, and so on and so forth. So I think a lot of artists during this period move through these various positions, you know? Um, and you know, it's difficult to kind of engage with them as purely abstract or figurative, and we need to have a discussion about that. How do you put these practice into perspectives, you know? Um, which is also something that I think that, you know, uh, Ritten's work brings up for us. A fourth stream now, you have the WSCs, All India Handicrafts Board, Handloom House, NID. And a fourth stream that is important to mention here and which often gets neglected by our present obsessions with all things handmade is the presence of the mill sector in Indian textiles. So since the late 19th century, Indian industrialists had seen the importance of investing in spinning and weaving infrastructure. And many of the large mill companies by the 1970s and 80s had origins in this period and the early 20th century. Some of them were at the vanguard, vanguard of design and material innovation by now, such as the Calico Mills in Ahmedabad. 
Ahmedabad. And these were beginning to also offer among the early professional opportunities for graduates of textile design from NID and other art colleges. Interestingly, it was a textile designer from this kind of a mill mechanized production environment, Helena Perhuntupa from Finland, who came to India in the late 60s to set up NID's textile department. Interestingly, she also worked with Mary Meko, a pioneering company for its time, and we've heard from Ushmita about Ritten having worked and trained there. And it very much represented the move of, mood of the swinging 60s, its color and bold expressiveness for a post-Second World War, Europe and the world. And it was from this environment also that Ritten came back to India to start a professional practice using hand-intensive methods, such as block printing, screen printing, and hand painting. So actually, if you notice some of the names I've used of institutions. These are also that Ushmita speaks about. And what is interesting about Ritten is also that, so you have these contexts of that time. And I think something that became very alive in the discussions at the NID 50 Years Conference last year was that designers worked in all of these contexts. So if you ha you needed a job, you would go and join Tata Textiles because it was a very coveted contemporary uh, you know, corporate job and you earned the money. And then maybe you had an artistic practice on the side. You took time off after five years of working, go into the uh, field, you know, there was a there was a great obsession in the 60s and 70s about going back to the field by the 80s. NGOs had come up across the country like Dasakar and Barefoot in Rajasthan, Telonia, who were actually looking at, again, livelihood generation. So what is interesting is that unlike today's environment where often people get pigeonholed in very specific and you become specialists of, you know, producing for the export market for France or for Germany. You have this very interesting ability, and many of these artists and designers actually move these different worlds. Um, and despite the fact that we didn't have organized infrastructure, or perhaps because of it. So, um, I, like I said, this is a Mary Meko design for, uh, that Helena uh, did. And then she, of course, influenced almost three generations of textile designers from NID. Our teachers at the NID were taught by her. My second part, the second part of my presentation, having tried to address some of the larger conversations uh, uh, or occurrences uh, in the country at that point, um, looks at the kind of work being done by Ritten's peers and contemporaries. Among them was Nelly Setna, trained in Cranbrook in the United States, a small weaving college where incidentally she studied with Helena, uh, who set up NID's weaving studio before moving to Bombay and becoming a teacher for several years at the Sophia Polytechnic. She received several grants for research with her husband, Homi, who was a photographer and traveled extensively to work with textile centers such as Sri Kalahasti and Masali Patnam in South India. She developed a parallel practice of weaving tapestries like these, which from the 1970s onwards become, become synonymous with home decor in middle-class urban India, mimicked in stores and emporia all across the country. So, you know, all of us at some point may have seen pictures, or those of us who lived through the 80s and 90s, saw versions of these kinds of tapestry being sold to for interiors, you know. And few of us have actually tried to understand that some of these origins actually because traditional tapestry weaving like this for the walls is not something that was done in India, uh, except for rugs. So it's a very interesting kind of, um, you know, contemporary uh, occurrence for the time. Um, what is interesting is that, again, you know, so having a practice like this, teaching at Sophia, having set up NID's weaving department, she also actually gave the term Kalamkari. And what is interesting is that today, uh, people write histories of Kalamkari hand-painted Indian textiles for a thousand years calling it Kalamkari, but in historical records, we only have the word Kalamkar. And actually, she is attributed to having given the word Kalamkari, which interestingly, the book she wrote is actually for block printing. So, you know, so much of what we like, the Pochampalli sari that we take for granted, which only comes up in the 60s and 70s, the silk sari, Kalamkari also consolidates itself very much from this kind of, um, uh, the need to give names to these production centers. You know, earlier they would be called chins, or they would be called, uh, you know, they had uh, Sarasa if it was for the Japanese market, chins if it was the European market, and suddenly all of them came together in the ages or uh, under the ages of Kalamkari. So just to kind of give you an idea of how equally uh, versatile and prolific other textile uh, makers um, and those engaged with textiles, um, you know, what they were producing at the same time as written. 
Of course, then you have Monica Kuria, and we're really missing her today because she was also a very good friend of Ritin's. And I think both for Ushmita and me, she has been a great source of personal anecdotes about Ritin and other people in this period. Uh, she also trained at Cranbrook, like Nelly and Helena, and returned to India, working with WSC for some time in Bombay, while eventually, of course, developing her own practice as an artist, working with tapestries, which today are in important art collections even outside of India, such as the Tate Modern in London. Now, Mumbai last year had a major retrospective of the work of Prabhakar Barve, who was also involved with the WSC at this time. And he's another artist who did not only work with textiles, but developed a very distinct identi identity for his work, which negotiated the kind of currents we have seen earlier between one would, one would lose recall abstractionism and the figurative. Where the work of Barve, in my view, also fits into the kind of discussion that we are interested in today is that more than three decades since independence by the 80s, artists like him were verbalizing that the kind of abstractionism in Indian art and design, which was earlier largely attributed to Western influence and threads of European and American-centric modernism of the early to mid-20th century, in fact, had deeper roots in the Indian subcontinent and Asia itself through bringing up tantricism and older traditions of geometry. So, you know, for instance, Ushmita, when you show the calligraphy, you have a tradition of the Namavali, you know? So somewhere I think we have to also be conscious that while all of them were trying to very consciously break away, perhaps it's difficult to leave, um, you know, these strains that are coming from perhaps an older historical period. And it's just one idea to also perhaps look at Ritten's work not only as a disjuncture or as a new start, but also as part of a larger historicity of Indian textiles and say, you know, so for instance, Manisha was mentioning about the, the namdas you showed and they're remarkably like traditional Ladakh namdas. So, you know, these are the kind of, so perhaps one, you know, so. Yeah. So I'm just saying that perhaps we need to, you know, we often look at modern, historical, contemporary, and maybe we need to look at these practices as part of a much larger history of textile making in India. It's just an idea that perhaps someone may wish to further, you know. Um, uh, I'm going to come back to NID, uh, just to kind of come back to this, these multiple aesthetics that were sort of, uh, you know, occurring in various parts of the country. And this is actually a much recent work by someone called Bashobi Tiwari. And I'm only showing it because, um, you know, being made two, three years back, it reflects how strong that education of early Indian modernism was that, uh, you know, these are, you know, visual ideas that continue to be, uh, you know, uh, to revisit it constantly in the Indian ethos. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting through exhibitions like this to be able to see a starting point for them. So, um, so you know, instead of showing works of well-known designers like Abraham and Thakur and others who actually are in the public purview and you can look at the kind of contemporary ab abstractionism in their work as being linked to this modern genesis. Um, I just thought it would be nice to look at some um, other artists and one of them is Basho B. Tiwari. Now interestingly, this was a time that the government gave huge incentive to people who were exporting garments. So there was a 20% payback. So we've looked at uh, you know, all of these threads. And just to show you a few, you know, just a few images, a couple of images from what was happening at the same time, Ushmita mentioned that Ritan was also exporting garments abroad. So one of the stimulus was that the government gave incentives. So if you invoice for, say, one lakh for export, you actually got 20,000 back in your account. And people made huge amount of money and export became a big thing. It was, at, it was at this time that America and Europe started actually looking to India for garment manufacturing, outsourcing in a big way. And huge export uh, you know, establishments came up. So actually the NIFT, the National Institute of Fashion Technology, as opposed to National Institute of Fashion Design comes up, uh, modeled on the FIT of New York, because by this time you had, you needed professionals to work in the export business and you needed technologists because the designs were coming from the, from, from the buyers abroad, but you needed people to cater you know, to the requirements of the industry. So therefore, institutions like NIF become really important. Now, I'm just going to talk, I mean, we know about Anoki, another brand. Uh, we know about other brands like Soma, who came up during that time, uh, that looked at block printing. And there was a revival of this kind of um, traditional block printing of Sanganer in Rajasthan. But you also had a new uh, wave of designs that came up during this, t this time. Uh, but you know, one label at this time, um, that uh, had started in the 60s was that of Ritu Kumar. 
and the early genesis of Ritu Kumar, which is now today 92 stores and a multi hundred crore business, uh, apart from continuing to export uh, internationally, was actually doing printing uh, for uh, brands like Roshafi and others. So these are actually archival images of Ritu Kumar's work that were do they were doing for other brands, you know. So this was just to kind of give you an idea of one of the many companies like Ritan who were exporting. And block printing at that time was something, something very, very big. Uh, it was a time that actually this kind of easy fashion in the West was being accepted. There was a, you know, there was a cultural renaissance in the West where people wanted to loosen up, have, you know, less corporate jobs. There was a kind of looking to India and Asia for a certain kind of aesthetics, you know, the kaftan becomes very important. Suddenly Morocco is on the, you know, world map and all of this is, is happening. So within this, you have a brand like Ritu Kumar as well as another peer, uh, because often we may not look at fashion designers uh, of this period, um, you know, as contemporaries of Ritten in a, in a conventional discourse like this or something like this. Now, these the companies actually made their millions or their deep pockets actually during this time exporting. Um, so with this, I pretty much conclude uh, my presentation, but with certain suggestions. Um, one of them is that uh, perhaps because of efforts like this, we are now in a position to view Shantini Ketan, NID, um, Auroville, in Tamil Nadu, the Theosophical Society, what was happening uh, in the Baroda College of Art, all together as part of different expressions of an Indian early modernity or late modernity, whichever way you look at it. And one of the things that is often not looked at, and um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in this, and we're working towards an exhibition on this as well, is actually how this reflects, for instance, in all fields. You have literature, dance, so you have the Bharat Natyam, which becomes this contemporary dance, which is uh, invented by... Um, um, Rukmini Arundali in Kalakshetra. And what is interesting is that the Kanchipuram sari that she then develops for that Bharatnatyam dance is also, um, is also uh, reflective of the kind of early modern ideas coming from theosophical society and, you know, the kind of conversations that were taking place. So, you know, we often may not look at a Kanjivaram Sari today, which has become the archetype today, but it was actually reinvented during this time by completely taking away its motives, figurative designs towards something that was global, that was pan-national, something that could be appealing to not only somebody who understood the symbolism of a particular symbol in Tamil Nadu, which was conventionally the case, but some, something that could then be worn by people from all across. So you have every instance in the country, if you look at Chanderi, you look at Banaras, you know, all of this was going on and I think we really need to look at all of these occurrences together to form, um, you know, an idea of what is a larger um, non-aligned aesthetics. Thank you for bringing that up, Nancy, because I think India was politically very much a part of South-South Asia dialogues, uh, you know, Asia-African conversations, the non-aligned summit, trying to distance itself from, you know, either you're with the USSR or you're with the USA during the Cold War. And we need to look at these aesthetics, including Ritans, as part of um, a huge political non-aligned message that was going on. Uh, you know, you couldn't import anything at that point. So, you know, if today everybody, um, you know, you have these buttons that are made in cloth, but Indian designers like Asha Sarabhai, Ritu Kumar started using them because you didn't have buttons in the country. You didn't have zippers, you know. So you had to go back to traditional systems of stitching because India was a closed economy, you know, and we have to look at, therefore, how the aesthetic develops within this kind of closed economy situation while it's still exporting. So all of these dynamics are very, very interesting. So one suggestion is that as a future um, series of conversations, we look at you know, perspectives from larger, uh, from, from all across the countries of what was happening in studios, in companies, at, on ground. Um, the second, again, is to, um, to revisit why this kind of global aesthetic, you know, was appealing. Um, and like I mentioned that, you know, uh, there was this need in the early decades of India's independence, also because of, you know, India's independence had occurred at the cost of the partition as well. And there was this huge, huge um, trauma. And in literature from the period, you look at constant references of how specific reference to ethnicity in design and textile should be removed towards a larger idea of design, which would be national. 
you know, which would be pan-national, uh, rather than specific to your community, caste, religion, and so on and so forth. And from that point of view, this image, which I should have brought up earlier, but I thought it would also be nice to end with, uh, of the Corbusier tapestries, which were made in the 50s and 60s, for speci especially for Corbusier's commissions uh, for the High Court uh, and the institutional buildings in Chandigarh, are very interesting. They're among the greatest modern tapestries in the world, designed by Corbusier, inspired by Indian motives, something you see for the first time in his practice anywhere in the world, that he actually took Indian references from myth and mythology and inserted them into tapestries. Uh, and they were produced by Panjadari weavers in Punjab. So there were workshops that were set up to produce these massive tapestries. Um, and these are the Panjadari weavers or the same community that later gives us India's, one of India's first international brand like Shama Huja Indaris, uh, Fab India, which was supplying to Conran and Habitat, you know. So we have to look at all of these things also in perspective. Well, why this image is interesting because you have, in that sense, the Corbusier tapestry is reflecting Nehruvianism and this liberal idea of a new India. Um, and you have Gandhi continuing this idea of hand spinning in Gandhi. So these are really two very important aesthetic streams that we inherit. And they both continue to be relevant even today. Um, and the third, and I conclude with that, is to come back to this cushion cover, is um, how do we engage with practices like written in, a, in an environment where, unlike the West or Japan or other parts of the world, you have a genre of fiber arts. So you have artists who identify themselves as working primarily with textiles. And India doesn't have so many of those artists, so we don't even have a community to create an organization or a biennale or a movement around it. So how do we actually look at practices like written vis-a-vis art, design, um, and the fiber arts. And is there a way for us to kind of start looking at it uh, either for provocation or as a consolidation of an, of, of a, of a, of, of an area that has been underlooked? Uh, can we look at practices like written to pave way for a new kind of terminology that can accommodate some of these um, uh, practices that have been on the fringes and not in mainstream visual arts? Thank you. <laughs>